our land acknowledgement. Yale University acknowledges that indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Shattuck, Golden Hill Powagusset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquian speaking peoples have stewarded through the generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these people and nations and this land. The Divinity School recognizes the role that Christianity played in colonization movements and repudiates the use of Christianity or any other religion for the purposes of oppression. We encourage all to work for justice in the aftermath of colonization and to reject racism and anti-indigenous attitudes in all forms. And now we will have our welcome by Dean Sterling. Welcome, one and all, whether here or online, to the 322nd year of Yale University and the 201st year of Yale Divinity School as a distinct unit within this university. We are celebrating our bicentennial this year. We chose not to celebrate it last year, I think for obvious reasons, called a pandemic, uh, and to celebrate it this year. We are also celebrating anniversaries for members on the quad. Sarah Drummond representing Andover Newton School in January, we trust, will sign a historic agreement making permanent Andover Newton's affiliation with Yale Divinity School and Yale University. Andrew McGowan representing Berkeley Divinity School celebrated their 50th year here at Yale Divinity School last year, but like us, chose to defer one year for a celebration and are celebrating it this year. And Martin Jean, representing the Institute of Sacred Music, is celebrating the 50th anniversary of ISM here at Yale Divinity School this year. There's a lot to celebrate institutionally, but the most important reason to celebrate is not our institutional histories, it's the people. I would like to introduce the new people to you. Let me begin with faculty. Teresa Morgan, please stand when I call your name, an internationally acclaimed scholar of both classics and of early Christianity comes to us from Oxford University. Molly Zahn, considered the leading authority in her generation um, of the Dead Sea Scrolls, joins us from the University of Kansas. Peter Grunt also joins us from the University of Kansas. He is, he's a widely acclaimed pedagogue, joining us and the English department in a joint appointment. Jamil Drake, who's recognized as a rising star in his generation, has come to us from Florida State University. And also on the tenure track faculty, Kiyama Mungambi, who has already established his place in the churches of Africa, as well as a scholar of Christianity in Africa, joins us from Kenya, Africa. And last but not least, and listen carefully to how I word this, while she is yet on the faculty at Harvard Divinity School, Todney Thomas is a visiting presidential fellow this year. Would you join me in welcoming all these new faculty? I also want to take this occasion to introduce one new staff member in addition to the administrative team. A graduate of the University of Chicago and Yale Divinity School, she has most recently been the minister of the first in Summerfield 
United Methodist Church in New Haven and the director of our Methodist Studies program. The Reverend Vicki Flippin joins us as the new Associate Dean for Student Affairs. Vicki will be with us halftime in September as she transitions out of her ministry and then full-time beginning October 1st. The largest group of new people are 118 new degree-seeking students, 59 MAR, 48 MDiv, 11 STM, and eight non-degree-seeking students. 35% of you are from underrepresented groups, 11% are international, coming from countries ranging from Canada to Germany, from China, the Philippines, and South Korea to Ghana. You range in age from 21 to 68 with an average age of 29. 33% of you already hold an advanced degree. And you come from a wide variety of backgrounds. And I realize that to mention any is to run great risk, but just a sample so you have an idea of what our colleagues are now like. One, Andrea Barton Rees is the first ever chief executive officer of the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority. Edward Ford was a city council person in Middletown, Connecticut and stepped down to come to school here. And Justin Pasco served as a head winemaker at Neshoba Valley Winery in Massachusetts and is still in the wine business. So uh, Justin will have to talk. But <laughs> we welcome all of you. Uh, you are joining 171 very talented returning students, bringing our total to 297. Among those, I want to recognize Tamara for Ravello, the president of the Student Council, who read our land statement. I think it would be safe to say you would win the election again <laughs> if we were being held now. It is our tradition to recognize students who welcomed all of you to the orientation. So I'm going to ask everyone, all of the students who are involved in small groups, etc., if you're here, please just stand. Hold your applause just for a minute. Let all of them stand. And then I'm going to invite the four directors of the orientation to come forward. I've got a little something uh, to give you. Jamal Davis Neal Jr. was the BTFO coordinator. Jamal, would you please come forward? Drake Douglas was the chief of staff. Drake, would you please come up? Ryan Lindsay Arundel was the hospitality coordinator who made all of us feel welcome. And last but not least, Antonio Gansley Ortiz was a coordinator for diving into divinity. Yeah. Thank you for all your work. Please give all of them a hearty round of applause together. You, you can be seated. I also want to recognize a couple of staff very quickly. First, Kit Healy has worked all summer long.
He was helped who, by someone who could not be here tonight, Lisa Bajwa, but we will give her a little present and be sure to say thank you to Lisa. And I want to acknowledge the two Lynns, as I call them, because they had an instrumental role in all this. Lynn Sullivan Harmon helped to oversee this, and Lynn Haversat helped to make sure your rooms were all there, etc. Please join me in thanking both Lynn. This is our bicentennial. I once stood next to President Salovey in the Beinecke Library. I don't know if you'll remember this or not, Peter, but we read the original charter of the collegiate school together, as it was then known. The charter stipulated that the school was to educate students for public, and this is Old English, P-U-B-L-I-C-K, uh, employment both in church and civil state. When a group of ministers met in Sabra to draw up an advertisement for the new collegiate school, they spoke of the grand errand of the school. The phrase grand errand was probably a play off of the Puritan phrase, errand into the wilderness, that was first made famous in a sermon delivered by clergyman Samuel Danforth in 1670. Danforth obviously drew his inspiration from the biblical tradition of the Israelites in the wilderness. He argued that Puritans should be faithful in keeping their charge. But that phrase has appeared three more times in our history. Once in 1760, when President Ezra Stiles used it to define it as freedom of religion and the right for each individual to think for themselves. A second time in 1957, when Professor Roland Bainton used it as the title of the first chapter of his history of this school. And finally, in 1990, when Dean Tom Ogletree charged the school to venture un uncharted paths, to undertake a new errand into a new postmodern wilderness. We have elected to use this phrase for the title of the history of this school, which will be released in October. And we do so like President Stiles and like Dean Ogletree to say that we need to redefine our errand. We are beginning this year with a Janus-like approach. We look to our past, we celebrate parts of our past, we apologize and rue parts of our past, and we look to the future and try to envision brand new routes through the wilderness in front of us. This year we will try to do both. I hope you will join in these. One way we have chosen to mark this was to commission a new hymn. We are grounded in the daring, which we will sing following President Salovey's address. The words were written by Professor Thomas Troger, who will join us with the angelic choir today. He is in his reward. The, word, the music was written by Mark Miller, <laughs> professor of church music at Drew and lecturer here. Mark, stand up. <laughs> So today is our inaugural lunch. I'm sure we'll sing this many times, uh, but sing it with as much gusto as you can. Uh, a little over a year ago, I realized we weren't going to have a proper celebration unless I asked somebody else to lead this because it just is too involved. And so I thought of my predecessor. I called him and promptly helped him to fail retirement by bringing... Sterling Professor Emeritus, transformative dean of this school, Harold Attridge, back to lead us through this year. Harry did a wonderful job with the task force. Some of you were on this last year, helping to plan a lot of events for this year and will help oversee the events this year. And so it is with a great deal of pleasure that I invite Harry to please come forward and turn our thoughts now to God.
<clears throat> Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask that you be present with us today as we begin a new academic year. We do so filled with inspiration from those who have preceded us and hope for all those who now follow in their footsteps. For 200 years, your servants at Yale Divinity School have explored the meaning of their faith and learned ways to effectively serve all humanity. The richly diverse community of faculty, students, and staff gathered here today is committed to the pursuit of light and truth. Bless us, we pray, as we continue the grand errand of this school in its third century. Enlighten our minds and strengthen our hearts as we confront the serious challenges of this time. And be with us always as we learn better how to serve your church and your world. In your holy name, we pray. Deuteronomy 8, verse 11 through 18. Take care that you do not forget the Lord your God by failing to keep God's commandments, God's ordinances, and God's statutes, which I am commanding you today. When you have eaten your fill and have built fine houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks have multiplied, when your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then do not exalt yourself, forgetting the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, an arid wasteland with poisonous snakes and scorpions. God made water flow for you from Flint Rock and fed you in the wilderness with manna that your ancestors did not know, to humble you and to test you, and in the end, to do you good. Do not say to yourself, my power and the might of my own hand have gotten me this wealth, but remember the Lord your God, for it is God who gives you power, gives you power to get wealth so that God may confirm God's covenant that God swore to your ancestors as God is doing today. Amen. We are honored to have as our guest speaker today, the Chris Argris Professor of Psychology and the 23rd president of Yale University. And I introduced him like that because that's how I got to know him. I first became acquainted with Peter Salovey as the author of an article on emotional intelligence before I was ever at Yale. I, when I first read that phrase, I thought, this is an oxymoron. But I came to deeply appreciate what that meant, and now when we hire faculty, we try to measure their EQ as well as their IQ. He has a very impressive record as a scholar and a teacher, and just read his Wikipedia page. I'm not, I'm not blowing steam here. But his administrative record is even more impressive. Under his leadership, Yale has added a new school, the first since 1976, two new undergraduate colleges, including one named Polly Murray, which has a certain resonance with us, increasing undergraduate enrollment by 15%, made significant progress in student financial aid, and launched a major university-wide effort to, ver to diversify all of Yale. I could go on, but I want to tell you one other personal story that you wouldn't know unless I told you. And I need to give you a little bit about his background to, so you'll understand and appreciate this story. President Salovey 
is the scion of a very distinguished rabbinic family. They are known as a Soloveitchik rabbinic dynasty. Soloveitchik is the family name. One member of this family was Joseph B. Soloveitchik, who became the head of the rabbinic school in the Yeshiva University and a major figure in the modern Orthodox movement. He only ordained about 2,000 rabbis. Uh, that must be a record, I, I would think. Uh, he was affectionately and respectively known as the Rav. Uh, Another branch of the family is known for their work in the Brisker method of Talmudic study and are heavily based in Jerusalem. And another branch Americanized the name Soloveitchik to Salovey, which doesn't mean they forgot about their faith, they just took an American form of the name. After President Soloveitchik was installed as the 23rd president of Yale, he visited us in the old refectory we purchased a Talmud to give him. He, he didn't know this. And we, we had to have about three or four students, four or five maybe, it's a, it's a big set of books, carry the Talmud out to give to him. And when President Salovey and I walked out with moisture in his eyes, he said to me, I have never owned a Talmud. My brother inherited my grandfather's this will go in the president's office at Yale. And it is on the shelves of the president's office. So I want you to know that we not only have a distinguished scholar and administrator, we have somebody who understands what it means to be a person of faith and can relate to a divinity school in a way that not everyone else could. Would you join me in welcoming the 23rd president of our university? Thank you, Dean Sterling. That was such a nice introduction. I really appreciate it. I'm very proud of my family's roots. We didn't become Soloveys from Soloveitchik until my grandfather emigrated to this country. And uh, I, I suspect a clerk at Ellis Island said to him, Soloveitchik, that's just too long <laughs> for an American family name and shortened it to Solovey. My grandfather at the time didn't speak much English but he knew a few words, and he said, OK, you can shorten it, but I want to make sure that L-O-V-E is still in the name after you cut off the chick. The uh, Soloveitchik is a small nightingale, and Solovey is a nightingale. So we grew in stature, I guess, when we came to this, <laughs> this country. On some other occasion, maybe I will talk to you about uh, a book written by my third great-grandfather that I only discovered about five years ago, uh, where he, uh, uh, in a town called Volozhin, which is in Belarus now, uh, ver uh, where, where the first European, modern European yeshiva was built uh, uh, by his grandfather, uh, wrote a book, wrote a book trying to reconcile um, Jewish thinking with New Testament writing. And I've always tried to imagine what it was like for him to write that in those days. This was, uh, I guess, I think the first version of the book came out in the 1850s. And um, uh, I'm, I'm proud of that because I think it's a reaching across the aisle in a way uh, that uh, uh, was only starting to happen in those years and rarely happened among uh, the rabbis associated with uh, the great yeshivas of um, Eastern Europe. Well, welcome to all of you, our new students, our friends, uh, our co my colleagues, uh, new faculty, uh, some of whom I have met at receptions in the last couple of weeks, others I I'm still to meet. It's great to see all of you, a special Welcome to those who are attending remotely, 
Uh, I believe we are streaming this ceremony across the country, indeed, around the world. And uh, it is gratifying that so many are here and so many are watching uh, as we commemorate 200 years of this preeminent theological institution and the beginning of its 200 and first. Uh, its enduring imprint on our university community is obvious to all of us. Indeed, its imprint on the world is magnificent. Well, since its first graduating class of eight, eight students in 1825, the Yale Divinity School has facilitated rigorous scholarly engagement and spiritual formation in ways that have produced generations of leaders. To date, as Dean Sterling has observed, it has put forward more heads of colleges, universities, seminaries, and denominations than any other peer institution or seminary in America. And in addition to its expansion in size over the two centuries, the Yale Divinity School has broadened its curricular options through the three partner institutions here on the Quad. It also bridges an array of Christian and other faith traditions within an inclusive ecumenical setting. In more recent years, we've witnessed the school implement a plan to strengthen its leadership position for the 21st century and launch transformative projects like the Living Village to shape the future of theological education, indeed, in, in, in lifestyle as well. Yet today, as Yale Divinity School embarks on a new century of unbounded possibility, I'd like to discuss with you its unchanging purpose and the resolve of its graduates in realizing it. Indeed, through its progression from a regional seminary to a global pace setter, the school has been guided by an enduring pursuit, a pursuit to foster the moral focus first chartered in Yale's founding documents and later cemented by the forebearers of the Yale Divinity School in the early 19th century. And now, in our era, a moral focus needed more than ever before. As 15 enterprising students of theology noted in, 18, in an 1822 petition to further their divinity studies, the education of young minds for the work of the ministry was a principal objective of Yale's founders. Indeed, we can see the seeds of what would become Yale Divinity School when in the summer of 1701, a group of 10 clergymen gathered in nearby Branford. There's a very interesting controversy about Branford and Saybrook, Old Saybrook, both of which, uh, both of these places were instrumental in the founding of the university. It's why we have colleges named for Branford and Saybrook. Uh, and uh, different things happened in different places in quick succession. In Branford, each minister offered their most valuable possessions, their books, as the first visible sign of Yale's founding. And collectively, they would create a college to educate religious leaders for church and state service. By 1701, the ministers successfully petitioned Connecticut's general court Right? We weren't a state yet in 1701, to formalize what they had founded, the charter of the collegiate school as an institution wherein youth may be instructed in the arts and sciences, who through the blessing of Almighty God might be fitted for public employment. These are the words that Dean Sterling read, both in church and civil state. In time, Yale's forthcoming divinity school would reflect this founding purpose of the university. And in our time, its work to prepare leaders helps us to advance our broader mission of improving the world for this and future generations. In Hebrew, that is called tikkun olam, repair the world. And I have tried to make it part of my mission as Yale's president. Our charter's call to 
develop theological reflection alongside scholarship began with a curriculum comprised of theology, logic, physics, and ancient languages. A fulcrum of faith and of Christian life in the region, the collegiate school quickly gained regard for producing many of New England's leading clergy. And its first student, Jacob Hemingway, would be emblematic of peers to follow. Jacob led a new congregational church in East Haven following his 1704 graduation. And by 1745, half of Yale's graduates had joined him in the ministry. And as quoted in documents from the Yale School of, what, from, from the Collegiate School, far more than those in medicine or law. Over the century, as the newly settled col uh, colonies became a country, the university founded the first congregation on an American campus. And Yale became a center of the Great Awakening and produced civic leaders for local service and theo theologians of global distinction. Yet, as historian Brooks Mather Kelly writes of this period, Yale's education for the ministry was merely preparatory. Indeed, it was still necessary for graduates to continue their studies under an established member of the profession, ministers who were often too busy, inadequately trained, or had a library insufficient for the task of postgraduate education. So a new model was needed to meet the new wave of interest in parish work ushered in by a series of revivals. A second Great Awakening had suddenly catalyzed Yale's push toward a new frontier in theological training. And out of an era of revolution and an ethos of revivalism emerged the divinity school we celebrate today. Those who matriculated as part of the L Divinity School's first generation would go on to have world impact on congregational life, education, and foreign missions. That's a quote. And it would serve as forerunners. They would serve as forerunners of the rich leadership tradition upon which you build. For centuries, Yale Divinity School has, through the legions of religious and lay leaders, social reformers, scholars, public servants, and others that it has educated, it has provided extraordinary contributions to church life and to theological education, indeed, to solving the problems of the world. I think, for instance, of those who exemplified the school's highest ideals, such as the Reverend Dr. Rena Joyce Weller uh, Carafa Smart, the first black woman to graduate from the Yale Divinity School and a global champion of ecumenicism. I think, too, of the most Reverend Michael Curry, who is the first African American to serve as presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. And there are more recent alumni who bring Yale Divinity School's spirit of service to callings that provide humanitarian aid, work towards social justice, and protect public safety. It's a spirit we see in graduates such as Jason Coker, president of, rural develop of the Rural Development Coalition, who says the lessons of human compassion and equality he learned as a minister guide his work in poverty relief. And over the summer, Anthony Campbell assumed the role of Yale's police chief. Chief Campbell is guided by a code to police others as you would want to be policed, the title of a course he taught at Yale Divinity School on community police ministry relations. He has a degree from this school. I'm delighted that his call to service as a Yale Divinity School alumnus will benefit our university community. Of course, even as we recognize the ways Yale Divinity School students have pushed the boundaries of progress during the last two centuries, we must also reflect with humility on the institution's role in inhibiting it. Even as Yale Divinity School produced leaders and produces leaders who are creating a more equitable and just future, we must also examine the hard truths of our history. 
to recognize the school's entanglement in slavery and racism, and to begin as best as we can the task of rectifying it. So in January, the Yale Divinity School issued an unprecedented statement acknowledging that racial injustice is part of its history, part of our history as a university. It did this because moving forward requires an honest reckoning with our past. And because the moral focus of Yale Divinity School aims to nurture call, aims to nurture calls for us to acknowledge when it was abandoned. As part of January's announcement, Dean Sterling detailed a series of actions to create a more inclusive Yale Divinity School. He stated that the Yale Divinity School will not ask for forgiveness without working to change our institution. Among other important efforts, the school is allocating $20 million in endowment to provide scholarships to incoming students who are dedicated to social justice work. And Lynn Sullivan Harmon, the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, has laid out a comprehensive DEI plan to advance the school's effort to combat racism, including the establishment of new research funds for projects related to social justice. As the school puts in place curricular and operational infrastructure to ensure that everyone in the Yale Divinity School community feels they belong and can thrive, I'm so pleased that Dean Sterling and YDS have tripled the number of faculty from underrepresented groups and doubled the number of staff and students from these groups. YDS is also contributing to the Yale and Slavery Working Group chaired by Sterling Professor of History, David Blight. You'll hear a lot more about this in the coming academic year. The group is investigating Yale's, the university's historic entanglements and associations with slavery, the slave trade, and abolition. And it includes two Yale Divinity School faculty members, Willie Jennings, Associate Professor of Systematic Theology and Africana Studies, as well as uh, Kenneth uh, Minkema, executive editor of the Jonathan Edwards Center. And the project was further assisted, further enriched by the involvement of two Yale Divinity School research assistants, Christy Charnell and Wyatt Reynolds. Of course, as part of our work to promote belonging, we also acknowledge and resolve to remedy the systemic marginalization of women. Although women participated in classes at Yale Divinity School as early as 1907, coeducation didn't formally begin until 1932. For decades thereafter, women were deprived of housing options on campus, subjected to enrollment quotas and constraints in the classroom. Yet, as they faced such inequities, Women leaders were undaunted by the pursuit of both confronting and correcting them. Trailblazers like Dr. Karafa Smart and Caroline Chen, the first Asian woman graduate, would forever change theological education at Yale. More recent decades, M. Sean Copeland, the first black woman faculty member, and Dr. Rebecca Chop, the first woman to serve as dean of YDS, have built on the dedication of those first women who led the way. I recall, I've been at Yale a long time, 41 years, and I recall when Dean Chop became dean of the Yale Divinity School, I was sitting next to a deputy provost named Pierre Hornberg, and he turned to me and he said, Dean Chop, that's really a better name for a provost. But, <laughs> Well, Dean Chop and others transformed the Yale Divinity School into a place where women tenure-track faculty members outnumber men, where women currently comprise half of the school's current student body. As Yale Divinity School raises a strong voice for the theological imperative to address injustice in society, it is also demonstrating the moral leadership that other 
pressing challenges of our time demand, including the climate emergency. In response to increasing awareness of global warming, Yale Divinity School and the Yale School of Environment forged a pioneering joint degree program nearly two decades ago. And in 2016, the Yale Divinity School committed to funding the world's first large-scale sustainable campus student residence. And you know about the Living Village, a complex that will house Divinity School students, will be powered by renewable energy, will rely on sustainable water practices, will treat its own waste, will supply surplus solar power to other buildings. It's a regenerative structure and will set a replicable example of how to put eco-theological principles into practice. It will serve as an exemplar of Yale's Planetary Solutions Project, which is bringing the full weight of our expertise and resources to bear on pressing crises like climate change and biodiversity loss. Of course, even as it represents innovation to the world, the Living Village will have an even greater impact on the Yale Divinity School community. It will reduce the cost of attending Yale Divinity School. It brings us closer to our goal of empowering graduates to choose their career paths on the basis of their calling rather than of financial constraints. Indeed, as Dean Sterling announced in January, the Yale Divinity School will meet the tuition need of all aided students who are more than 95% of your population and offer small stipends to assist with living expenses. Second, its inclusive design, this is the village, will foster a greater sense of belonging as the school dramatically increases the diversity of its faculty, staff, and student body. And third, common spaces will be devised to facilitate social interactions and community formation among all of you future leaders. As we look forward to the launch of, Living of the Living Village in 2024 and to the flourishing future it represents, I'd like to conclude by looking back once more to how the Yale Divinity School began. If we look at minutes dating to September 1822, they suggest that members of the university's board of trustees agreed to fund a theological department, as it was called then, out of a deep interest in the prosperity of Yale College. And certainly, as they forecast, the establishment of the Yale Divinity School has been to our community's great fortune. I think the Yale Divinity School swiftly met their highest hope. And yet, I suspect it would now shatter what they would have thought of as their grandest expectations. Because this is a school that has not merely added to the prosperity of Yale University, but it has added to the prosperity, and I'm using that word quite broadly, to the broader world of which we are a part. What started as a modest venture to supply clergy to the New England region has since become a wellspring of scholarship and service that benefits humanity. It is enriched in a dark and fragmented world, an education of veritas with rays of looks. It has allowed Yale students to pair their pursuit of knowledge and understanding with a sense of high moral purpose. And it has helped our graduates, therefore, to mobilize the power of a Yale education for the common good. So as we reflect on the richness of the Yale Divinity School's 200-year history, I join a grateful university community in gladness. Yale, the Yale Divinity School, has fulfilled in spades the mission and vision of its first benefactors. It has delivered an equal measure of value for beneficiaries of global reach it is invigorating to think about what its third century will bring. In that context, I move to quote Rabbi Tarfan from the Talmud, from the Talmud that 
the Divinity School so generously presented to me when I became uh, president of Yale. In a section of the Talmud called Perkei Avot, uh, the wisdom of our fathers, sorry for the uh, sexism in that title, but that, that is what it's called. Why don't we say the wisdom of our ancestors? That's probably a better translation. Um, a book that actually is filled with interesting kind of just bits of wisdom from many different scholars and rabbis over the years. Rabbi Tarfan writes, it is not our obligation to complete the work, but neither can we desist from it. So in all of our celebration, I acknowledge, I think we all acknowledge, this is a place that doesn't look like it did on the day of its founding, doesn't look like it might have to those first students. It is a far more impactful school. It is leaving a mark on the world through its scholarship, through its teaching, through all of you who will move to that world from your studies. And it's easy to be complacent, to say, yes, we have arrived. Well, we have gotten somewhere, no doubt about it. But we have not completed the work. Our obligation, as Rabbi Tarfan tells us, is to continue, to not desist, to continue to make progress. When I look out at you all, students, when I look at our faculty here, We've come a long way just in the 41 years I've been at Yale University, first as a graduate student, and then as a faculty member, and later as an administrator. But we have not completed the work, and we will not desist from it. I wish Yale Divinity School every success for 200 more years and beyond. And I thank all of you for being part of this historic moment in this historic school, in a historic university, one that can be proud of the history I summarized today, but will always look to the future. Thank you very much.
I want all of us to once more thank President Salave for his speech and thank Mark Miller for this song. For the first time since 2019, I can invite you all to a reception <laughs> at, at this event. We, weren't, we haven't been able to do this for two years. We did it somewhat outside last year in a limited way. But this year, we just get to party. So <laughs> Professor Teresa Morgan is going to lead us in a benediction. And after that, I would ask if you'd wait till all of the faculty process out. We'll ask President Salovey to help lead us as we process out, let all the faculty come out, and then all of you join us in the old refectory and we'll celebrate. Professor Morgan. Almighty God, at the beginning of a new year, we bless you for our creation and preservation, for our health, and strength, and all the blessings of this life. For the vocations that brought us here, and for this school, and this university, and the many benefactors whose generosity supports our life here. We ask your blessing on the life we will share, and the work we will do individually and together in the coming months. Bless the families and friends we have left behind to come here, and those who have traveled here to be with us. Bless those whose teaching and care and inspiration have helped us to be here today. Bless those who have left this place this year on new journeys in many different directions. By your grace in the months to come, may we be a blessing for one another. And by your grace, may we go out from this place to be a blessing for the world. To the glory of God, creator, renewer, and spirit of life. Amen.